Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's Understanding Indigenous Storytelling and Drumming webinar. I'm Rashid Clark, Marketing Specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy. Hope you're doing well, staying safe, and thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I also want to thank the Community Foundation of Mississauga for making this webinar possible. And a big thank you to our donors and supporters who have helped us through this uh, tumultuous year, to say the least. And if you've benefited at all from our nature education programs or simply from being in the park that we work to preserve, we hope you'll consider making a donation to our holiday campaign. All donations made before December 31st will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000. You can give at the riverwoodconservancy.org. As always, we do appreciate your support. Uh, before we get into our discussion today, all of us at the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And today this place is still home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land. Now here's where uh, COVID restrictions make things a little different. Uh, for each of our presenters today, uh, we have a tobacco tie that I would have offered them in person, uh, but we'll do our best to still show our respect as we ask our presenters to offer their knowledge to us today. Uh, so first to Vivian Riclay, I am offering you this tobacco for speaking about Indigenous storytelling and the winter solstice. Uh, to Tim McGregor, I'm offering you this tobacco for speaking about Indigenous storytelling and the winter solstice. And to Tabitha Shergold, I'm offering you this tobacco for speaking about Indigenous drumming and song. Thank you, Miigwech, to Vivian, Tim, and Tabitha for being us today virtually. And we can't wait to see you all in person again someday when it's safe to do so, hopefully soon. Uh, for everyone watching today, if you have questions for our presenters, please type them into the Q&A tab in Zoom. And that's enough talking from me. You didn't come here to listen to me talk. Uh, so I will turn things over to Vivian, first of all, uh, for the smudging and we'll carry on from there. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Rashid for your um, kindness in offering us a SEMA virtually. And um, you know, it's uh, something that's been uh, part of the COVID uh, response to uh, getting um, that request done in a good way to uh, Indigenous the guidance and knowledge and Indigenous knowledge and, uh, and stuff that uh, we're doing over Zoom now. So the other day I got a package in the mail before I was asked to do something and I thought, wow, wow that's amazing. That's so great. And I think, you know, that's a very good way of doing it with the medicine wheel teachings on it. So I'm, I'm so grateful for our people's um, creativity in uh, coming together to honor that SEMA because that's our first sacred medicine. And miigwech for that. And I'll ask you to put it out on the land for myself as well. So that way we can uh, speak on today's uh, event. So like anything else, we like to introduce ourselves by our, um, by our Indigenous names, clans, and uh, gives you some sort of an idea of our responsibility in the community. And because we only have an hour, we're not going to go in depth into uh, what my name means and um, what my clan does and, and all of those uh, beautiful things that are associated with who we are as Anishinaabe uh, people and our, in our way of life, our Anishinaabe Odzawin, uh, we call it, uh, because it's a uh, a lot more detailed and entailed in um, who we are as a people, as women and, and men. So the most important thing that uh, we, we just uh, experienced was that the ritual of that Sema offering to ask us for our, our um, Indigenous knowledge to be shared with everybody here and um, acknowledgement to all of us who are here. Uh, we also have in our uh, way, uh, we're all always grateful and, and pay a lot of respect and homage to our our way of life and, and part of that has to do with uh, how we start off in a good way to, to any circle, any gathering, any one-to-ones, um, -one, so people asking us for advice and stuff like that. So we enter into a little ceremony uh, and um, a lot of people refer to it as smudging. Uh, I've been in the habit of trying to get back into my language and, and calling it what it is ex exactly. And it's a and it's a, a ceremony in itself. And it's uh, to cleanse your mind, body, and spirit and to, to come together in a good way with that good intention and focus on what it is that we're going to be doing here today. So I'm going to light my, um, 
um, Scudero out here with uh, Scudero, and um, Scudero is the light. And I'm using my little Nogas, which is um, the smudge bowl, a uh, bologna shell. And, and my new ones here, the eagle feather. And what we do is we take this smoke, wash our hands with it over our head to clear our thoughts, over our eyes and our ears to only see the good and hear the good, over our mouth to speak those good kind words and over our hearts to remember everything emanates from that core of our heart because that's where the kindness and the love come from. And when we do that, then we're ready to embark in a good way, doing the best possible way that we can um, help uh, people to understand more about our teachings and more about who we are as a people, the first people. Um, and we're always eternally grateful for the fact that we're able to use uh, our own way of life to bring ourselves together, to honor ourselves and to honor Mother Earth and all of the our relatives, our first relatives, the sky world, the plants, the animals, the waterways, everything, Mother Earth that uh, entails uh, our uh, connection to. So I'm just going to say that opening prayer in the language. So we give thanks to um, to the four directions for all the beautiful gifts that we have been gifted with. And when we do that, we are setting the tone for that beautiful stuff to come from our, our, our heart and our, our um, selves in a beautiful, good way in that uh, we teach it um, with a good mind and a good heart. Miigwech. So I'll ask uh, Tabata. Oh, I forgot my, uh, <laughs> my name is Vivian Reckley and uh, my uh, spirit name is uh, Bekasakwe, I'm Turtle Clan, and I'm from Wikwemkong First Nation, uh, the Bay of Beavers, and uh, I work and uh, play here in Takaranto. Chimiquetch. Uh, Chimiquetch. Wawana Bejo, Gishgate Quendish Nakas, Mayan Ganandodem, Saksi Gandonji, Anashnabe Quendel. I introduce myself in my language because this is how we connect to the creator and our ancestors and all those spirits that we uh, walk with on a daily basis. Um, my English name is Tabitha Shergold and um, I'm happy to be here and share some of the teachings that I have learned on my journey. Um, a few of which are from these two beautiful people here, Tim and Vivian. Um, so I will share with you today my uh, the teachings I've received on the drum before I sing the song. Um, so when we begin any any song, we start with the four honor beats to honor those four directions and the teachings that they have given us. Um, and then when we sing the song, we sing it four times. Depending on the song, we'll determine how many rounds you sing it in. Um, this particular song is called the welcome song. Guando uh, Day is how you actually say it, and it's a Mi'kmaq song. Uh, typically, they would sing this song first thing in the morning when the sun rises, because that's when we have the most connection to the grandfather's son. Um, so when we sing the song, we make sure we sing it four times to honor those four directions in this and the teachings that we have received. So I'll begin with the four direction honor beats. Here we go.
situations. So another reason why we sing this song is because we are welcoming all of our spirits and ancestors. That includes all of you who are participating today. Not just all of our energies and spirits, but our ancestors so that we can proceed in this session in a good way. So, it's you, miigwech. Miigwech. Tabitha, thank you so much. And uh, Vivian, thank you for the uh, smudging at the beginning and the uh, description of that. Tim, uh, I'll turn things over to you, first of all, for, first of all, a little introduction uh, for yourself, if you'd let us know a little bit more about yourself. No, miigwech. Miigwech Vivian, miigwech Tabitha. Proceed. And as uh, Vivian was mentioning earlier that, uh, and uh, Tabitha was talking about too, is that uh, we are uh, taught from a long time ago, that, uh, we're given uh, names that have significance to us, and this is what we use when we speak to the Creator. And Makwa uh, Dodem was, uh, was a bear clan that identifies my clan, and uh, uh, my place uh, where I originated from was Wigwaskinaga. Wigwas being birched in the land of the birch trees, Wigwaskinaga, where the line light shines off the birch trees is not to be confused with Wasoxing, which is pretty uh, shiny over there off those birch trees also too. So their names are similar, but they're, if you know the language, you know that they're quite distinct and separate. And so this is, uh, that's who I am. Uh, I would say English name, but my name is more Scottish, so it's Tim McGregor, so I'll, I'll stick with Scottish. My Scottish version of my name is Tim McGregor, and uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. And I've uh, worked uh, with Riverwood for a number of years, we all have, and uh, it's, uh, you know, in better times we'd be able to do this outside in a circle or inside in a circle like that, but it is what it is, and uh, we adapt to it, and that's the story of who we are, as being adaptable. and. Uh, you know, that uh, goes to the reason why we're gathered here today to talk about uh, things like storytelling, which is, you know, in, in a way, it's kind of deceiving that you tell a story, you know, uh, we look at it more than stories. There are, there are the truths. They are who we are. You know, the, the, the things, the legends, the teachings that were given is more than just stories. And so it's a, a convenient way of putting it. But you let that name, storytelling, you put us up there in the the land of myths and legends and uh you know they are part of that too but uh, there is more practicality and reality in what we're talking about and the stories and uh, teachings that we're going and we're uh, learned that from a different age you know we were on skype and zoom and all these uh, social platforms but if you think back uh, generations ago these didn't exist and uh, the way we had to do it was uh, even before uh, the school systems, and they don't really teach the teaching we need anyway, but uh, they we would have to listen to uh, knowledge keepers and elders would relay stories to us that would pass on those teachings, pass on the language, we can carry their language very well. And uh, that's because of, uh, you know, learning that as she went, you know, that, uh, I carry that language also too, and we, we've learned these and we try our best not to let that uh, go and we pass it on every chance we get, every time we get a chance to do it, I guess that... Uh, we find ourselves in a situation now where we were almost come full circle. We were the little ones years ago learning. And as time went on, we, we learned all what we have, the teachings and stories that go along with that. So, you know, stories is a way of telling, uh, passing on messages. You know, and this is uh, why it's so important to do that. And uh, we've learned those. And now I guess we've come almost full circle where we're the ones passing on those teachings and those stories now. So it's, uh, it's um, something that my mom bought said many years ago is that you have great responsibility once you start learning something. It's not meant to be kept. It's not meant to be hoarded. That's meant to be shared. And so I find that uh, this is uh, something that I'm following on, you know, just the way of Mandegizit Shigewa. That's the way we do things. You know, this is how we can continue our, our uh, you know, our who we are, all the stories and the teachings that go along with that, who we use that as, as much as we can. So I guess uh, this is why we're here. And, uh, you know, I, while it's called storytelling, I want to know, uh, people know that there's more, more than just telling stories. Because stories are, it's not fiction, it's reality. A lot of it's based in reality. We carry that on. <clears throat> and a good uh, person that passes on the teachings, we were told that, uh, you know, you do it 
exactly the way you were told to do it, that you were told that story was told to you and that uh, not to make stuff up. You know, if you want to make a good story, of course, you know, fiction writers will put a lot of stuff that doesn't exist into it. Well, that's not what we're, we're about. So whatever we tell is uh, told from the perspective of that's what I heard. And other people somewhere else might have heard more or, or spent more time learning it. But today, um, <clears throat> I'll speak from my heart. I'll speak to what I know. And, uh, you know, there may be questions that people heard at someplace different from someplace else. But uh, and that and with our teachings that we've learned, there's no right way and there's no wrong way. It belongs to whatever part of the country you are, whatever nation you are. There are different uh, uh, teachings that go along with different things. And uh, we can't get into those kind of comparisons of, of that. We're, there is no right or wrong or better or or not as good, you know, type of thing. We kind of stay away from those kind of, uh, um, I guess, delineations that we just stick to the stories that uh, pass on teaching. So it's been my <clears throat> going to be an honor to be part of this today. So now. And Tim, Tim, you know, uh, before we actually went live, uh, you know, all, all of us were just uh, talking and, and you had mentioned that uh, sometimes if you just sit and listen to someone, They'll, they'll get to a point after a long uh, response. And you answered several of the questions that I had for you before I even got a chance to ask them. And it's just from listening that I was able to, to take all that information in, 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 in asking or wondering what the importance of storytelling in Indigenous cultures. And you answered a lot of that already. Uh, so thank you. And uh, I'll just turn to Vivian. Uh, next question as we get closer to the winter solstice, which is uh, under a week away now, uh, a special time for people who honor and acknowledge the patterns of the natural world. And uh, on the winter solstice, the sun is at its lowest point. It's the shortest day, the longest night uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so what sort of stories or teachings uh, would be shared typically around this time of year at the winter solstice? Well, the natural world is a, uh, is a great source of our teachings and um, understanding um, our connectedness with everything on Mother Earth, um, the sky world, the sun, the moon, the stars, and, and other um, planets as well. We also have, you know, the full moon, which is a very important part of uh, what I do as a grandmother and water walker, as a full moon um, grandmother that does those ceremonies. I, I pay great respect to our interconnectedness with everything else. And in the beginning of time before colonization happened to our people, <clears throat> there was no formal schools. Rather, we learning was considered through lifelong processes embodied in the individual and the ceremony, reflection, sharing, caring, all those beautiful things that uh, were part of who we are as Anishinaabe people. And learning took place in the mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional being and rooted in personal experiences. So we were, we were taught uh, learning by doing things, you know, like uh, one of those things that uh, I do is uh, I do the full moon ceremony and my little granddaughter is a helper to me. I sit her in front with me so that she doesn't feel alienated from not being a very important part of that ceremony. A lot of times we um, think that the teacher has all the rights to do whatever the, their um, academic uh, things are about, but we also learn from our children. They are our greatest teachers. And one of the things that I myself, uh, I always give gratitude for is the fact that I pay attention to those young people and their, um, their teachings are very, very important for us. So we, we learn that by doing, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very beautiful way of doing things. And it's that time of, uh, for us, it is a time of darkness when we go into our, um, into our inward, into our spiritual selves to, to be able to look at the, all the stuff that is happening on Mother Earth. I mean, you know, with this COVID happening and stuff like that, I think that's one of the greatest teachers to all human life that power is far greater than any of us can ever imagine or, or take control of our here in the now. And we need to learn to respect and care about them. And those are the things that, uh, you know, we, uh, we pass on to our people so that they don't get over inundated with uh, anxiety and depression and fear. You know, fear was something that was not a part of who we are as a people. It was brought to us to control us. And I always tell people that fear is something that's a controlling mechanism to, uh, 
takes away from who we truly are, those beautiful people that we are. And, you know, some nations at this time of the year hold ceremonies, they have light their fires, and uh, we observe in different ways because we have many different nations here upon Mother Earth. And, and we go into that deep in, uh, into ourselves inward, but that deep mention to care for our spiritual selves. A lot of people don't understand what the spiritual selves of uh, who we are as a people pertains to uh, until you get into trouble with, uh, say, you know, you have bad, uh, you get news that you have uh, something wrong with your physical body, and then you start to give gratitude and thanks and bargain to say, oh, if I, if I pray and if I change my diet, if I sleep a little bit better, if I cook this away or put that away I my, I will be better again that's when you start to bargain for your life but you should be giving gratitude and respect from the beginning that you wake up every day and your whole day is totally beautiful after that because you have paid respect to the creator and all of um, mother earth's um, environment as well as the sky world and um, the waters and everything else that make us who we are a part of our life our connection to everything that we who we are as a people and we don't do that enough. And, you know, for Anishinaabe people, that's what we do is we learn by doing these things. And we have four ways of learning through doing, storytelling, through dreaming, and through ceremonies where we went fasting to actually learn what it's like to be with ourselves. Now, not too many people can be with themselves isolated from everything, food, water, just your, your, your medicines, and that's it, and the land. And that connection that you have with the cosmos and the environment and the rustling of the leaves and the wind and everything else becomes so evident in where your place is and that you're just a little molecule out there just like everything else that makes up creation so that's a uh, part of uh, what i think about when the solstice time comes and uh, making sure that uh, we carry on those legacies of storytelling and, um, you know, talking about uh, our lives and, you know, things have changed so much since I was a child. And I remember we never had, we never had to keep, we weren't allowed to watch TV. We had Sunday nights, one hour, bonanza. <laughs> the rest of the time was spent on the farm, counting the chickens, gathering the eggs and uh, being outdoors and on the land and with the land. <laughs> But now people are scared to go out. They're scared of snakes. My goodness. I said, you know, like, what the heck? We were never afraid of anything when I was a kid. And uh, even still to this day, I tease my granddaughter when we go out walking. She has to have this kind of special boot and, you know, <laughs> all these things. So, yeah, solstice time is, is uh, it's a big reflection of that dark, when the, when the daylight dark hours are more evident, you, know, you have that time to rest and nurture your spirit. And so a question for, for Tabitha, as we get into this time of the year, are there any particular strong songs, uh, drumming that would be done for specifically the winter solstice or for this time of the year as people get ready for the colder, darker days ahead? Typically, all of our songs are very, very traditional in terms of ceremony and things like that. So it would definitely depend on the nation will determine the types of songs that are used. And as Vivian said, because we have many different nations will determine the different practices, right? So um, for us, for the Anishinaabe people, we have definite practices in terms of specific songs that are used. Um, so having said that, uh, it, there are in the Anishinaabe nation, there are many different uh, nations within that. And so in terms of songs, yes, we have quite a few that we would utilize um, as part of storytelling or other ceremonies during this time. So we have, um, we have many options to choose from when it comes to songs. And uh, before I pose a question again to Tim, just a note from uh, someone in the audience uh, that you sound like their father, who is uh, from Fond du Lac Band in Cloquet, Minnesota. So uh, to Linda, who's uh, watching and commenting, thanks for dropping in that comment. And uh, Tim, you sound a lot like her dad. Uh, so uh, one question uh, for you, Tim, uh, as we get into this time of the year, what sort of a uh, spiritual feelings uh, arise as we get into the winter 
solstice and then into the winter months. Well, for myself, it uh, brings back memories from when I was younger. You know, uh, I, I too lived in the country as uh, Vivian was mentioning, and we had things that we had to do to get ready. And it's uh, winter was actually started before winter, we started in the fall and, you know, a lot of harvesting and uh, getting those ready to go. But uh, my job is uh, with, with my brothers, my dad, is, is to, uh, uh, you know, it's cold and lots of snow. And, uh, you know, we uh, didn't have oil stoves and all the kind of stuff before. We had wood stoves and we had to get a lot of wood. So there was, uh, you know, an activity that, uh, you know, not even called an activity. It was just a, a way of life. We had to make sure if you wanted to be warm in the winter time, you had to make sure that, you know, the wood <clears throat> was, was uh, cut and ready to go. I was stacked up and ready for that long winter that was ahead. And uh, as the days were uh, a lot shorter now, um, you know, there things you were doing would be, uh, you know, kind of dictated by how much daylight you had. And this time of year, as you mentioned at the start, the shortest time of the year. So we wouldn't really have a whole lot of daylight. So whatever oh. you do, there was no downtime or watching TV time or anything like that. It was, uh, you know, things that had to be done. And uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, the choice was there, yes or no. You had no choice. You just did it. That, and we never questioned that because that was the way we were, we were brought up. We had to uh, do that because we were part of a part of a family and a part of a community, and make sure that you know those uh, preparations were made. And uh, yeah, this was a time also was kind of like the tail end of uh, of uh, hunting season too. And if you didn't get what you needed to do in the late fall and stuff, you still continued late the kind of late season of hunting, which is about now. This uh, probably after the solstice would be. Mm -hmm. I know in our communities a lot of uh, hunters won't hunt anymore after that, just out of respect of. Uh, uh, the animal kingdom because they're carrying their young after that so it's it's not the time for uh, the time for hunting them has passed so if uh, you were still a little bit short this was the time to do it you know go out and you know do uh, I guess uh, getting things ready for the long seasons ahead so and uh, you know um, you know we did a lot of other things besides uh, we, were, we weren't slaves we had lots of free time too <laughs> we did a lot of uh, you know yeah. Skiing and uh, you know we played hockey and uh, Vivian knows and Tabitha knows that that that's like our I don't know, dare I use the word religion in our communities that we have uh, hockey goes steady steady and it's, it's one of those things that we'd go down to the ponds down to the lakes and we didn't have organized kind of things but we we knew enough to have our skates and our sticks and whatever and we'd be gone for you know all day from the time you know after you you did what you're, uh, you're supposed to the times uh, it was uh, dark, you know, and uh, you were expected to be back home only because that was a sensible thing to do. To get lost in winter is not a really good thing. And we learned that very early on. So we, were, we made our way home and, uh, you know, did a lot of things. We, we uh, looked at the, the night sky, how the stars were so clear and bright and, you know, the size of the moon and uh, different things like that. And then that would give us a lot of... Uh, you know, we didn't have the answers, but we knew who did. That was either Michelle, Michelle, Miss Nokomis, or somebody, aunties, uncles. They'd come around and they'd be around and they'd be passing on those stories and those questions we had. We'd ask them, and usually there was a, a good story that went along with each one of those things too. So it was a good time. It was a time of uh, getting ready for a, a longer, colder period of uh, times, harsh times. That time, you know, that uh, I used to remember going out with. Uh, eight foot of snow, you know, just to go get outside, you know, push doors back and stuff. We were, we're spoiled now. We only get, we get two inches of snow and people go in panic mode. Well, two inches of snow was an overnight dusting wherever we were at. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of perspective and looking into those things. But, um, you know, getting prepared for that was, uh, there was a lot of things that had, had to get done, you know, just out of a matter of survival. And I think that's where, you know, the lessons we learned were, as uh, we've been saying, the lessons came from nature. That's what we learned, a lot of what we, we had to do. And, uh, you know, if we didn't know it, we, we were curious enough to ask for it. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, that was our entertainment. We would sit there, you know, after dinner, we're on a stove or outside or the fire or somewhere else, and we listened to our, the older people, the elders, knowledge keepers, your aunties, your uncles, all those have been around a long time. We listened to them and they tell us stories, you know, of uh, things. And a lot of times, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, is that, uh, it might take an hour to get to a point, but uh, you know everything that 
goes into it goes into it's like painting a picture you know you just don't go but a straight line go straight to that point it was that flowering of, of the information that went wrong with it <clears throat> so at the end of the the story whatever it was an hour or two later you you understood what it was you didn't have that many questions because it's like you just mentioned there by the time i got to finish talking i had already answered three of your questions well that was the same with us too by the time we listened to some of our elders and elders keepers talking some of those questions we had were probably answered along the way and we probably learned a whole lot more than you know uh, we thought we might have. and we learned after a while that you know there's a there's a lot of a lot of things alone you just when you you thought you might know something there's a lot more to find out after a while i'm still learning i learn every day you know, it's never a never a never ending process and you know i'm just happy to be uh, part of creation you know the, my little part is still there you know we're that mini school part that vivian mentioned i'm still happy to be at that little mini school part when i draw air in the morning and open my eyes i say me which because it means you're you're still here and you're you still have a a part to play in there so to, uh, the young lady or whoever it was back there said i reminded him of their uh their cool, what her relatives would say big which you know we are anishinaabe people and we do get along in a lot of different places and our relatives have mannerisms and we have kind of ways of talking that would be similar so you know i i lived in wisconsin for five years and i was over to that part of the world uh, a few times i did a lot of dancing and stuff so i ended up seeing a lot of my relatives out in minnesota and uh Wisconsin and Michigan. So I say miigwech for thinking about me and then I, I, I'm happy that I remind you of somebody. It'll be a good time, I hope. And it, it was her father. So I'm gonna uh, assume that it was, yeah, it, it's a good memory I'd like to think coming through there. Uh, I'll ask uh, the next question to Tabitha. You know, and Tim, you, you had mentioned, you know, aunts, uncles being the ones that you, you know, pick up uh, some of these stories from. So for Tabitha, in terms of learning drumming, song, is that also something that, you would typically learn from other members of your family uh, or how would you pick up uh, a lot of that information and learn uh, the songs and the drumming? Oh, miigwech. Um, well, for my family, because of residential school and colonization, um, I didn't get a chance to grow up with those teachings. So I had to go back to the community in Toronto and seek out the elders in the community uncles and aunties in the community who are willing to share those teachings with me. And then by doing so, I was able to then connect with people who know who knew my family members. So from that, um, this is how I am actually able to learn the teachings. So for instance, with Vivian coming to the Indigenous Network to do the full moon ceremony, <clears throat> um, Sometimes I'm her Ashkawebis, which means which means helper. And so she's become an auntie to me in the community. And I look up to her as a mentor to share those teachings from woman to woman and be able to learn and understand um, the true meaning of an Anishinaabe Kwe. And to be able to share that with my four daughters is something that is very treasured because I didn't get that as a child. So to have these beautiful people here sharing the language and the teachings is something that's so invaluable to me. And I'm sure for many others that are just like myself. And uh, again, miigwech. Thank you for, for sharing that with us, uh, Tabitha. And, I'll throw this question to uh, Vivian first, but uh, anyone else feel free to to jump in as well. You know, when we talk about uh, the content of, of stories, you know, probably differing a little bit from from one geographic region to another, uh, is there any overlap between the stories of, say, First Nation, Inuit, Métis, or are they very different depending on the region that you happen to be in? And I'll, I'll pose that first to Vivian, but anyone else uh, feel free to, to to respond as well. There would be a different way of uh, incorporating the teachings, um, like the Haudenosaunee, the Mi'kmaq, the um, Anishinaabe people. But we all have um, the greatest, utmost respect for Mother Earth, the seven grandfather teachings, those uh, teachings of kindness, respect that 
ethnic of non-interference where we allow people to grow at their own rate, no matter where they are on their human journey. And I think it's very important for people to understand that uh, we haven't been given the right to criticize, critique, or judge anybody else who walks in their own skin and whatever their life entails. Uh, it's really hard for me to um, to see that in our uh, in our world because it's uh, that racism and that oppression and that lateral violence that takes away the essence of the beautiful human beings that we could be nurturing and 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 bringing up in life and and, and supporting them on their journey. As Tabitha was talking about, I, I'm just remembering, you know, like my father and my mother went to residential school. I'm part of the 60s groups. I was taken away off uh, the reserve when I was 11 years old. And my first point of contact with uh, non-Indigenous people was in school on the reservation. And that's where our language was a big part of who we are. We didn't know. As a child, I never knew there was non-Native people out there. We didn't know there was any other colors of people because that's not something that was part of who we were when we were growing up small. So when the nuns came onto our, our reservation and taught in the schools, they, they did things that were not kind and they were very meaning uh, trying to take the language away from our voice and, 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 and stop our growth of uh, who we are as uh, beautiful children and, and brought harm to us instead. And that, that introduction of that harm and that taken away from our language and those barriers that they put in front of us was very, very harmful. And I walked that journey until I was uh, finished uh, my nursing career and came to work here in Toronto. And I had to re refine my roots, find out who I was because I was lost. Yeah, sure, I had an academic mind that was empty of void of spiritual connection and context and all of those beautiful things that make up uh, who we are as Anishinaabe people. I, I, I went through depression and anxiety and hate and anger because of finding out about the residential school and those things that impacted on who I could have been and who our people could have been all along if that disruption didn't happen. But then again, it's a very big learning experience that no matter what happens to our people, we are still resilient enough to come, come together and, and nurture one another and support each other in um, like the songs that Tabitha and the Indigenous Network sing. When I first went there, none of the women were singing the songs and uh, you know, our Shkabe was that was uh, the fire keeper offered to drum a song for us. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, that's so beautiful because somebody is willing to do that. And that's who we are as a people. And we need to recognize the gifts that each and every one of us walk with and, and not put each other down in that way. We learn from one another. We learn to uh, create a community uh, outside of our own family and outside of our own communities to be able to live and nurture each other. And I think that's the most important part of that storytelling is because you get to learn the stories of other people's lives that, and how they changed and accepted uh, things on their journey and changed it for the good to be able to come back into that circle as a whole person and not a broken person, not a person that's been uh, rejected and ostracized because they don't measure up to somebody else's standards. And, and that's so important. For me, I work with marginalized homeless people that I always feel are adult children that never got the opportunity to understand what the residential school was, what the 60s groups was, what the Indian day school did to us and, and all those things. They just drifted through life, living in a different reality to nurture their spirit so that they don't feel that pain and trauma of loss. So yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the things is that ethic of non-interference that we I always find very valuable in my teachings because I don't have the right to judge, to criticize, or tell people how to do things. And we listen. And part of that listening is that you learn through that process of the journey what the answers are. We don't we don't question our elders. We don't ask why, why, why. I never ask my, my granddaughter doesn't ask me why because you know like well don't ask me why. You'll find out if you do it. If you go touch that fire, you're going to burn yourself. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things that are commonsensical. <laughs> Humorous at times, you know, and that's it. We have to go through those process of journeys in order to discover for ourselves what feels right and what doesn't feel good. There is no right or wrong way of life itself. It's the journey that you do learn from.
and important lessons and humorous as long as you get your hand out of the fire quickly enough. Uh, a question uh, I'll, I'll go to uh, to Tim for this one. You know, we've everyone's been you know sharing stories today, and is that something that is reserved for typically elders or certain members of an indigenous community, or is it just sort of a practice that's open to anyone who has a story that they'd like to share? I feel that's uh, open to everybody. You know, it's just. Um... I think that uh, from the time you're born to the time we, yeah, as you're growing along, you learn things. And uh, if you pay attention to them long enough, you can, you can teach them. I've seen, uh, you know, adolescents tell, tell, tell each other different stories so that they've learned along the way. I've seen, uh, you know, been part of um, groups of um, teens and that have been the greatest sources of, uh, of, of learning for me that have learned that they have a, you know, everybody has a different uh, worldview and the different age groups and they, and they bring so many things out that you would never think of so and to be able to tell those stories you know there are young people are the greatest storytellers there ever are you know you, you, you beyond one-on-one uh, -on -one, they they have a new a new format you know they have uh, the, the, the media the formats of the media you know i listen to uh the songs of resistance and uh, and they were talking about uh inequities in in uh, in Right from environmental crisis to social issues, by you know things like uh, snotty nose res kids and, and and listening to the songs and those people have messages and, and you know the memes they put out. You know, he says a picture tells a thousand words and it certainly does. You can you can write an essay you know for two or three pages, five pages long and never get to the point where a meme would and, and just that minute, that fleeting image there and that uh, you know the storytelling takes all different forms. You know this is uh, more of a if you want to use the word traditional type of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, group settings, that this is a good format too. But we also have to recognize that there are, are different formats and we have adapted and evolved. We started talking about that earlier, the adaptation and the evolution of who we are. You know, it's much the same that, you know, just uh, one time I was dancing, I first started dancing and I, I came up with a, you know, a bunch of people that are interested and they were there and they came over to me and they said that, uh, you know, uh, you have a really nice outfit or costume, you call it, to, to straighten that out and say, no, that's my, my regalia, my outfit. And they said, but, but you know, it's not really, it's not really traditional, is it? I said, well, how do you mean that? They said, because this book I had from the 1850s, you don't look that like that part anymore. I said, well, yeah, well, you got to remember that, you know, and I'm a historian. I went back to the 1850s and I told them at the time, this was probably before the era of a beads and, um, trade cloth and such like that and as that came we we evolved we adapted all that and we used that and it put it into our regular everyday outfits we put it into our regalias and as time went on we got into uh, the 21st century and now our traders aren't the Hudson Bay company traders trading off for furs anymore it well there still is Hudson Bay I wouldn't go in that store but we have <clears throat> we have things like uh, Walmart or, or Joanne Fabric or Fabric Land and stuff like that so you know, they have a lot, I'm wearing some of it right now, you know, so is that any less traditional? No, it's not because I wear it. And the person who made it for me made it in a, in a proper, you know, way of putting a lot of uh, love and energy into that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always adaptation and evolution. So, you know, that point about, I don't look like I do in 1850. Well, that's right, because I live in 2020, is it right now? And, uh, you know, we have adopted and evolved along the way, but it's still the, the essence of it, the core of it, that makes us who we are. So, you know, I'm sorry you live in 1850, but we don't. And so, you know, this is this is about as traditional as modern as you can get it. So, you know, that those are ways of getting to, uh, I guess, saying that the storytelling follows that kind of similar format too, is that we're adapting and evolving. Our young people are very, very adept at telling stories and much the same as Tabitha and uh, maybe in, in all of our, you know, cronies that we hang up and we learn with a long time. We we have that kind of the old, the old way of telling <clears throat> stories, and and that that's going to be important too because a lot of what you do, you know, it's like learning language online or courses. That's very good. You know, you can do it, but sometimes the inflection, the sound of the voice, the tone of the voice, you can't duplicate that in in learning. So. Going back to talking to somebody one on one is probably going to be very important. I think that I tell a lot of our, our young people that learning stuff. I said, 
great grandfather Google is a good source of information. One, because you don't have to give great grandfather Google Sema. But at the same time, when you ask great grandfather Google about teachings, he will give you, unless you specifically ask, he'll give you a, gen, a broad, generic brand of a teaching that came from a whole mishmash of about 500 different nations in, in the <clears throat> Turtle Island. So, but if you ask me, I could only give you the one I know. So that's the difference there is that the storytelling will always need one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. That'll always be preferred method, but there are so many different ones now that still get the message out. And, uh, as we, I just getting a check on the time here, we'll uh, we'll start going to some questions uh, from the audience. And so uh, everyone watching today, if you do have questions for our presenters today, please type them into the Q&A panel. We'll get to as many as we can before we reach uh, the end of the broadcast today. So uh, first question coming in for all of the panelists. Uh, have you ever attended a full moon ceremony uh, with your family each full moon as you grew up uh, at home? Is there anyone in particular that wants to address that first? Growing up on my uh, on my land where I come from, um, we never attended the full moon ceremony. Uh, the family that took me in uh, there did have ceremonies because as kids, you know, how we sneak around and peek around and see what's happening. I knew they were having ceremonies because now that I'm an adult and see those ceremonies, I know what they were now. So they had to keep things underground. So because of that fear of uh, the kids being taken away and taken to residential school and, and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. But as soon as I became aware of the full moon ceremony, I understood who I am as a woman and my responsibility for that water, water, which is life. And if people understand that on that context, because that grandmother moon up there is the one that governs all women, regardless of what color you are and where you come from, because you're capable of giving life, you're capable of bringing forth life and you should be understanding and learning what that moon can teach us. And, and for myself, uh, that's, I learned it here in Toronto. Takaranto, the land of many nations. And uh, I'll move on to, uh, first of all, uh, Vivian Miigwech for the uh, response on that. Uh, next question coming in, uh, a little bit of a preamble here uh, from someone who works in the research sector which is very Western culture oriented. I also have a great respect for the indigenous culture and values. Can you suggest what and how I can integrate from First Nations cultures beliefs into my life to give more perspective to my everyday affairs here on the traditional lands of North American people? A long one, uh, but uh, anyone wanna jump in with uh, some ideas on, on what non-indigenous uh, people perhaps can do to uh, feel a little bit more uh, connected to the traditional lands of North American people? I think you go to the source of uh, expertise. You go to an indigenous person. <laughs> Do not be afraid. <laughs> you come with that Sama and good intention and uh, you will find out what it is that you're looking for. You know, a lot of times I think non-native people were afraid to talk to us or invite us because I remember working in Sudbury and uh, we used to have uh, the Indigenous Day celebration at Bell Park and uh, set up our boots and have fun drumming and everything else like that and celebrating. And uh, my uh, collaborative of uh, people that worked in um, Sudbury, the different organizations said, how come we never get to be a part of that? And I said, did you ever ask? And they said, no. And I said, well, there's your answer. <laughs> So I said, come and set up your booth and offer some gifts and offer something to the community. That's all it takes. You just have to participate in a good way. A very good answer. And uh, again, go to the source. You guys are not scary as I have, as hopefully all of us have learned. <laughs> this is not a, a scary conversation to have as long as it's done respectfully. And uh, again, I think everyone uh, watching today, I'm just monitoring the chat here and I'm seeing just lots of just one word chat comments, which is miigwech from a lot of people. So I think uh, there's a lot of uh, gratitude from uh, all the folks who are watching today. And uh, I just a quick comment from the Community Foundation of Mississauga. Uh, we are very proud to support this very important programming for the Mississauga community and beyond. 
beautiful stories, healing and delightful. And thank you to the Riverwood Conservancy for organizing this. That's from Lorraine. Thank you, Lorraine. And thank you to the Community Foundation of Mississauga again for uh, making this uh, possible. Again, a reminder as we get closer to uh, wrapping up, if you have any other questions, please type them into the Q&A panel or into the chat. Uh, a question for Tabitha, you had mentioned uh, your four daughters and uh, being able to connect with them. So how have you uh, been able to you know, impart some of your stories, drumming, song with them and, and how have they uh, received it? Um, good question. Well, for, I have four daughters. I have three that are adults and one that is nine. So in the beginning of my journey, my adult daughters were little and I was just starting to learn. And that's when I was just connecting um, to the resources in Toronto. And the beginning of my journey actually started with me participating in teachings of the sweat lodge. And in those teachings, we were instructed to hold some sema in our hand, in our left hand, because that's the closest to our heart. And then when we did that, we were told to ask a question. And if the spirits felt that we were ready, they would respond. So I thought I knew everything and thought, ah, this is not gonna happen, push off. So anyways, I asked the question and you know how when you go to sleep, you, you, you can't turn off the images in your mind. And so that's what was happening. All of a sudden, everything went black and a person appeared, a man appeared. He reached down to a woman who I thought was my mom at the time and he turned into a wolf. I asked the elder who was the facilitating this workshop. I said, what does this mean? He said, maybe your grandfather is the wolf clan. I said, no, that's the only true piece of information that I do know he was the Eagle clan. Three weeks later, I went to see an elder by the name of Sugar Bear and asked him the same question. He put medicine in my left hand, told me I'm gonna drum and sing and pray to the ancestors, ask your question. Told me to open my hand first time. He says, what do you see? I said, looks like a dog. Three more times, what do you see? Second and third time, I said, it looks like a dog. Fourth time, he says, what do you see? I said, I don't know, just looks like medicine in my hand. Gets up out of his chair, pulls my hand back and says, that's a wolf howling at the moon, you're the wolf clan. So three weeks prior, I got a vision. My grandfather came to me and gave me my clan, which is what I asked for. And so from then, these are the teachings I've been sharing with my daughters. And as a result, including the drum, which is the heartbeat of our mother earth. It's the heartbeat of our mothers and the first sound that we hear. So when we play this drum and I play it with my family, they know, for lack of a better term, I mean business, because mommy's connecting to the ancestors, mommy's connecting to the spiritual world and, and the great creator. So with that, that drum is very sacred for our people because it's our connection to that heartbeat and those spirits who gave their life to create that drum. And when a mom means business, you better pay attention. Uh, I think is <laughs> good, good advice for all of us. Um, last question I think we'll get to from, uh, from our audience today before we start to wrap things up. Uh, a question coming in from Denise. In these times of disconnection, I want to walk outside at the dawn and then on the darkness on solstice. Any ideas to questions, actions, gratitude to reach out and in? I'll leave that open to anyone who wants to jump in. Perhaps Tim? You don't, Vivian. Um, the question again was what? In sure. This time of sure, I'll, I'll go through it again. Uh, so someone uh, writing in, in these times of disconnection, I want to walk outside at the dawn and then the darkness on solstice. Any ideas to questions, actions, gratitude to reach out and in? You go within your own self of what it is that you're looking for 
but you must be offering that uh, respect with your tobacco, praying for that gratitude, because our teaching of uh, the tobacco, the sema, I like to call it the sema, I don't like the word tobacco, because it takes away the spiritual essence of the medicine itself. So when you pray with that sema in your hand, you're connecting to creator and um, your spirit inside of you. And that sema travels ahead. It already knows what it is that you're looking for and goes to tell creator exactly what it is that you need to do. And I always think about, you know, that beautiful, powerful medicine that uh, gets so abused and how people disconnect from that spiritual essence of it. So use that tema to guide you and you will intuitively know in your own heart how to do things. And, you know, we don't just pray for ourselves. We never ever just pray for ourselves. We pray for everybody. We pray for our families, uh, people that we don't even know. We f pray for the four colors of man on earth and we pray for those animals we pray for that sky world we pray for everything that is part of life and and uh and how we fit in that circle of life we give gratitude for that so when you start doing that on a daily basis you will for find the difference in your own self of how you approach every day and what changes you feel you're going to feel so different if you continue to do that because you know one of the hardest things I ever learned was to pray, to pray for somebody that was hurting me. I was told, don't get mad, don't go call, calling them names, don't go and uh, do horrible things, pray for them. And, and I said, oh, I would rather eat this tobacco than pray for them. I said, you know. But I did what I was told and, and life became so much easier and I became so much more connected because I got to see the, the ducks and the swans and the turtles and, and, and connect with that water on a different level because that's where I offered my sema and peace came into me, peace and respect and uh, uh, forgiveness for that person because it wasn't about me, it was about themselves and where they were at. We take on other people's problems as our own because it's thrown at us. It's not ours, we don't keep it. We pray for the person and you know we don't accept that when it's thrown at us. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we're getting close to uh, our allotted time. Uh, question for Tabitha, would it be appropriate to have a final song drumming before we wrap up. And uh, if that's the case, I will I'll throw things over to you for uh, for that final song before we uh, call it a day for a day. Good you, Miigwech. So when we end any kind of teaching or ceremony, I myself uh, like to uh, sing what's called the women's travel song. Um, when we sing the song, uh, we sing it to honor those four directions and the teachings that they've given us uh, in those four rounds. And in the fifth round, we sing that song to honor those ancestors who came to join us in the teachings or the ceremonies. Um, so when we sing the song, we do start with the four honor beats as any song, and then we start singing and drumming um, the four rounds. The last round, we actually tap on the side of the drum, use a rattle, or some people don't, don't use any instruments at all. Um, and they're just connecting with those ancestors as they're on their way out. And we thank them for joining us. And we thank all of you for joining us and sharing your energies and spirits with us in that good way. So with that, I'll begin.
this last round we go on the end the edge of the, the drum and everyone has to sing because i'm not doing it, just singing for my ancestors we're all singing for each other's ancestors ready Miigwech, Tabitha, thank you so much for that. And I think uh, just so everyone knows, uh, Vivian, Tim, myself, we do, were muted, so we didn't have any feedback, but we were singing uh, during that last round. <laughs> uh, so uh, miigwech to all three of you one more time for being with us today, sharing all of your uh, knowledge with us and, and making things a lot more accessible to a lot of people who I know probably have a lot more questions and uh, you know, a form like this is, is very much appreciated. So uh, once more, Vivian, Tim, Tabitha, miigwech uh, for being with us today. And thank you again uh, to the Community Foundation of Mississauga for making today's webinar possible. And to everyone watching today, again, miigwech, uh, thank you for sharing your time with us. And one last time, if you do have the ability uh, to make a donation to keep our education and conservation work going so we can continue to have programs like this, we'd very much appreciate your support. And until December 31st, all donations will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000. And so you'll have double the impact when you donate at theriverwoodconservancy.org. That's all for us for today. Thank you again uh, for joining us, Miigwech. Stay safe, and we hope to see you again very soon. Great.